Hello, and welcome to the Inside Writing Podcast. I am your host, Josh Sippy. As a reminder, all of these episodes are recorded live Wednesdays, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. You can sign up on the Gotham Writers website for free. Now then, on to the show. Today, we are talking with Matteo Escarapor. Matteo's work aims to empower people of color to seize opportunities for advancement, no matter the obstacle. He was a 2018 Rhode Island Writers Colony writer in residence, and his writing has appeared in Entrepreneur, Lit Hub, Catapult, The Rumpus, Medium, and elsewhere. His debut novel, Black Buck, was an instant New York Times bestseller and a read with Jenna Today Show book club pick. He lives in Brooklyn, and you can follow him on Twitter and Instagram at Ask Mateo. Mateo, welcome to the show. Josh, thank you for having me, brother. Everyone who's here, thank you for showing up. All right. Thanks, Mateo. So, Mateo, I want to start, as the, the theme of the season suggests, with that breaking endpoint for you, and then we'll scale back from there as we go. But was there a moment where you felt like you really broke into the writing industry? Was it, you know, the first sale of your book, getting an agent, or maybe when you just started writing? But when did you feel like you really broke into this industry? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, Josh. It's it's also a hard one. Um, there were all these different inflection points in my journey, and and more inflection points that are even happening right now. And I'm probably in one without even without even realizing it. Um, for me. One of the most significant milestones is in my journey was in November 2017. I had written two manuscripts already. I'm a self-taught writer, don't have my MFA, um, wasn't taking any great workshops, even though back then if I knew about uh, Gotham writers, probably would have taken a couple here. Um, and I'd written these two manuscripts and I hadn't gained the representation of an agent no book deal, a lot of rejection, um, no real help from anyone in the industry because I didn't know anyone. But it was November 2017 after querying with my second book and, and not going anywhere with it that I had to make a decision. And at that point, I felt as though I had hit creative rock bottom. And I had a conversation with myself where I said, okay, are you going to continue to pursue this dream? right? I was doubting myself heavily more than I ever had before during this writing journey. And I was saying, you know, who was I, this startup guy, the salesman to think that he could go and not just write a book, but then get gain representation, which thousands, right? If not a million people or hundreds of thousands are trying to do around the world, um, or even just here in the States, you know, who did I think I was that I could even get a book deal? Um, but at that point, I said, it doesn't matter whether it's going to take, you know, four months or four years, I'm going to write the book that I want to write for the people I want it to resonate with in the way that I want. And that's when I had the idea or a cruder version of the idea of what would be my debut novel. And I began writing it a few months later, January 2018. So for me, Josh, that point was so significant because I reached what I refer to as the effort stage. <laughs> you know, I said, I'm not going to pander to these agents anymore. I'm not going to pander to the industry. I'm really not even going to pander to readers, but I'm going to first and foremost, try to write something that impresses myself, but also something that I believe is true and could have the capacity to help people and positively impact them. So that I would say was the most significant turning point of my journey and was what allowed me to write the work that would go on to be my debut novel. There are definitely other <laughs> significant um, milestones such as yes, getting an agent. For me in my mind, getting an agent for so long was something that felt so far out of the reach of, I'm not gonna say what was possible, but the more and more I wrote, the more and more I pursued my dreams and the more and more I wasn't getting an agent or gaining representation, it felt as though, okay, is this something real or not? You know? So by the time it came down to it, me getting an agent, I was like, wow, this is, this is actually happening. And when I got the agent, the confidence that I had in my work was only increasing. So when we went out on submission, 
you know, when that first week passed, I was like, okay, I know that some people get a deal within their first week or the first couple of weeks, you know, where is this deal? And then, you know, the second week passed and I was like, all right, what's going on here? You know, e even though it can take a year to get a deal or more, you know, the, the time doesn't really matter all that much. But then when the deal came, um, man, I broke down. I was on a plane from San Francisco because before I got my book deal uh, to make money, I was consulting with um, different, different startups um, throughout the States. And one of them was in San Francisco. And I remember get, getting that, that book deal, um, accepting it rather than going to an auction, just breaking down in this bathroom on a plane. So yeah, those were, those were a few of the significant turning points in my journey. A lot that I want to touch on there that you mentioned as well, but I want to start with, you know, we often hear about writers who have written books previously. And then for whatever reason, those didn't work out. You, you answered this more or less, but I, I want to ask specifically, what do you think it was about those earlier books that wasn't clicking that made Black Buck click so well? Man, to be honest, um, the writing mm -hmm. wasn't that good. <laughs> For like the, the first two books, the first book had a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. It had a strong voice, but it wasn't that cohesive. It was sort of all over the place. And for anyone watching, I'm going to be super honest. That first book, I didn't even edit it when I sent it out to agents because I didn't know what I was doing. So I didn't even edit it. It wasn't clean. It wasn't polished. Um, the second book, I had learned a little bit more about the business of writing and more about um, how to structure a story together, primarily from reading a book by uh, an author named James Scott Bell called Plot and Structure. So the book was tighter. It was more cohesive. I had outlined it from beginning to end, but it felt as though it was lacking vigor. There was no real power to it. The voice wasn't strong. So it's like I, I exchanged from the first book to the second book. You know, uh, I sacrificed a voice and energy for cohesion and uh, a solid structure. And that book didn't go anywhere. So with Black Buck, I had grown as a writer in terms of my artistic sensibility, knowing what I deem to be good art or good writing. I had grown as a writer in terms of my ability. My abilities has, had grown. And I had grown as a person to where I could quiet all of that doubt. I could quiet all of those anxieties, all of those questions about what is even going to happen with this and focus on the work and most importantly, have fun. <laughs> It was with a black buck that I was really having fun on the page where I felt free, where I wasn't too worried about what was going to happen in, in X amount of months or, you know, a year, you know, and don't get it twisted. I definitely did want an agent and a book deal, but those were no longer priorities one and two, right? Priority one that I mentioned earlier was to impress myself, to write something that I'd be proud of, to write something that I hope would be able to help people in some way, um, in, in the same way that this book could have helped me if I would have read it years prior. So, um, yeah, those are, those are a few of the differences between the first two manuscripts and Black Buck. And I want to dwell on that, the, you know, the whole getting an agent, because for so many, like that's, that's essentially the first thing you have to do if you want to go this publishing route. And for a lot of writers, I know that feels like once you get there, everything's paved in gold. It's, it's all made for you there. Is that, can you talk about it, like how you saw what it would be like to have an agent before you got one? And did it, was it exactly as you thought? How did it change things? Man, I love this question. I'm happy that we're really, <laughs> that, we're, that we're drilling down here. Um, I'm taking a second to gather my thoughts because I thought many things. Okay, <laughs> to, go, to go back to what you said, right? An agent is the traditional way, but you don't need one. Mm -hmm. I've met many authors who did get their MFA, who had published something in their MFA and got scouted basically by an agent who had read their work in a magazine, right? The typical literary MFA magazines like N plus one, um, Guernica, those. I had met other writers who had published things online then an agent had read it or other writers who made connections through their MFA program with a prominent author, then this prominent author introduced them to an agent. There is no one narrative to success and there's no one narrative on how to make it here. I went the most traditional route of going, going through the, the slush pile, which is definitely the hardest route, I believe, right? Because as many of you in here know, you're querying agents with a pitch, trying to get their, their 
ears and eyes and then going through the slush and then they hit you up and then they read your work and then your work has to resonate and then they have to make sure that it's something that they can actually sell and then right um so that for me was the path that I took and I'm, I'm actually happy that I took that path because it gave me a sense of confidence that I might have otherwise not had and if I didn't have confidence going into this game when I broke in, um, especially with the book that I wrote, which whoever has read my book, Black Buck, you can tell that a lot is going on, that I'm riding a fine line in many ways between reality and absurdity, satire, authenticity, right, sincerity, um, humor, horror. If I didn't have confidence going into this, I could have taken a lot of differing and, and at times contradictory advice and my book might have not turned out in the way that I would have wanted it to. So what did I think about getting into the game, right? 2016 is when I began writing seriously. I was still working in the world of startups and I was looking at agents as the gatekeeper. Uh, I'm not going to say a necessary evil, but maybe sort of. And um, I was thinking that this was going to be my partner my shepherd, the person that was going to bring my work into the world. After that first manuscript, not going anywhere, getting a ton of rejection, I realized that it was going to be a little bit harder than I thought. And I couldn't basically charm my way into the industry. Remember, I've mentioned this a few times. I came from the world of sales. I was good at convincing people of things. Um, but I realized after that first book didn't go anywhere that what mattered most was the work not your smile, not how articulate you are, not if you can be buddy-buddy with people and they like you, but that can matter, but, but more so the work itself. Um, so at this point, I was saying, okay, now, now agents definitely aren't going to just fall in my lap. I'm not going to be able to finesse any of them into, into offering me representation. Um, so now I have to, to work harder. Um, and at that point, with the second manuscript and the second manuscript not going anywhere, um, I was like, man, I really, really want, really want an agent. Oh my God. I want an agent so badly. How am I ever going to get an agent? It's sort of like when you close your first deal, the first deal in many ways is the hardest. Um, or when you do something that feels a bit intangible and I was like, how am I? Oh my God. I, I had elevated agents. I'd put them on this pedestal. Now flash forward from November, 2017, to July, 2018. I was working on the second draft of Black Buck. I had rid myself of all of these anxieties about the publishing industry. And um, I had decreased this need for validation from an agent. Again, I still wanted one because I didn't know editors and I couldn't sell the book myself. But I wasn't like, oh my God, please, my life is going to be complete when I, when I get an agent. And I met a writer at the time who many of you might have heard of, Jason Reynolds, incredible middle grade and young adult author. Jason became a good friend of mine. And I met him around July 2017 is when we actually became friends. And he said, Mateo, you need to understand with what you're writing and the quality of your work, an agent would be lucky to represent you. And I was on this path already of feeling confident, but having this, this literary celebrity we have a handful of literary celebrities in different rungs of their career, right? Of course, you have someone like Joyce Carol Oates, right? You have Colson Whitehead, you have um, Stephen King, all these other writers who I never even read, like John Grisham and David Baldacci. I heard David Baldacci speak in Savannah a couple of days ago. Um, Jason is one of these people in the literary stratosphere uh, for what he does. So having this man, you know, stare at me and say that to me, only helped my confidence grow and it's what I needed. So now I was viewing agents as a partner. I was taking them off of this pedestal. So often do we put these gatekeepers on a pedestal because they are keeping the gates. But we have to realize, and I don't mean to be preachy, but I think it's important for people to hear this. We have to realize that they have just as much to gain, if not more from our work than we do from our relationships with them. It is a two way street. And my agent, I love her. But mm, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I love her, but this is, this is my train. This is my train that, that I am the owner of. And there can be different conductors, different people at all times, but I own the train. That is my career and that is my work. And no one's going to get in the way of that. Today, speaking about my agent, love her, 
we work very well together. Um, what I enjoyed about her most and what I continue to enjoy about her, but specifically when it came to my debut novel, is that she never promised me anything. She was never gassing me up saying, oh, you're going to get a big deal. This is gonna... Nope. And the one or two times that I did ask her questions, she'd say nothing is guaranteed. It's very hard to sell fiction right now. We'll see. She was obviously hedging her bet in case it didn't work out. But that grounded me in such a meaningful way um, that allowed me to keep my feet on the ground while also having my head in the clouds a little bit. But she wasn't, she wasn't painting these dreams for me so that when everything did happen, when the book, when we sold it, when we had this huge wave of support from Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, which is now Mariner Books when they were bought by HarperCollins, which as of yesterday, they were bought by a private equity firm, right? Um, so that when we get this huge wave of, wave of support from them, it felt amazing. And I was grateful. New York Times bestseller, I was grateful. Some TV stuff, grateful. But what matters most honestly are the messages that I get from readers. Um, the point here being though, that because she didn't promise me anything, everything felt that much more special, that much more earned. And I'm grateful every day but at the same time, I'm not going to play this game of that. I have to just be happy to be here because that's another way that people try to gaslight you and basically get you in this industry. Let me stop there. No, that's so much truth in there. I, I, don't, I don't even know how to get to each one individually. But one thing I wanted to ask you about, particularly because it sounds like you and your agent do work so well together, is, yeah. you know, I know a lot of writers out there who think, you know, once I get an offer from an agent, that's the agent for me. And that's not necessarily the case. So I'm curious what your situation was with Black Buck. Did you get multiple offers? Did you, you know, balance agents or was this agent immediately apparent to you as the right agent for you? Let's get into it, man. Wow. I haven't <laughs> been able to talk about this in so long. I am very grateful for it. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this is what happened. And I'm going to try to be short here. So in 2018, when I was writing Black Buck, I was consuming a ton of art because I realized I had to get my creative sensibility up. I had to have a firm understanding of what I deemed to be good art. It's hard to say what is good art because that's relative, right? But what I deemed to be good art. So I was reading a ton, watching a ton of doc documentaries, films, TV shows, listening to music in ways that I hadn't before. Uh, I'd roll to New York City. I was living outside the city, but I'd roll to New York City, listen to readings be the last person in line to ask an author, you know, a question or two. Um, and that was super important for me for, for understanding the industry and soaking up the energy of people that had done what I wanted to do, but also honing um, my own ear for art. So not just consuming a piece of art and saying that's great or that's bad, but understanding why it was good, why it was bad. Um, while I was doing that, I was also, writing essays. I was, I was trying to um, get some credits under my belt, A, because I wanted to see if I could do it, B, because I knew that that would help strengthen my query letter, you know, by having a few credits to name at the end of places I'd written in, and C, because it, it was fun and it was pushing me in a way that I needed to be pushed. So 2018, an author Morgan Jerkins, right, who had written This Will Be My Undoing, instant New York Times bestseller. Morgan was like 25, 26 when that happened for her too. She wrote a, her first novel, Call Baby, which came out last year, C-A-U-L space baby. Morgan and I had connected. She was one of the few people who gave me time when I just cold emailed them. And um, she had reached out and asked if I wanted to contribute to an anthology for Medium called Traveling While Black. Uh, she had me pitch to her a couple times. She wasn't really feeling my pitches. And I was like, yo, I'm done with this. Like I'm writing a novel right now. But I said, let me give her one last pitch. Gave her one last pitch. She said, that's the one. So wrote seven, 800 word piece for Medium. They paid a dollar a word. It was the most I'd ever been paid for writing. I was like, what? Yo, what? So wrote this piece that was about a semi-traumatic experience. It was really more bizarre than it was traumatic, but it was unsettling for sure about something that happened in Italy and got a flood of comments because millions of people read medium.com every month. And I said, wow, you know, I've been trying to 
pitch essays for months at that point, not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> I would email the New York Times two sentences. <laughs> I'd email them two sentences and say, hey, got a great got a great idea for an essay about X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. Let me know if you want it. I didn't know how to pitch, but I had read, um, I had I had done the whole thing with Morgan that helped me better understand pitching. And around that time, I had read an article on Catapult called Pitching and Moaning, Moaning, excuse me, by a man named to Tony, and I'm going to mispronounce his last name, my apologies, Tulamite. Or, 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 or something like that. Pitching and moaning, anyone who wants to read this article. And that gave me a format and helped me understand how to structure them. So 2018, after that medium essay with Morgan, whoo, my hand got hot. I went on a pitching, I went on a pitching spree and I was placing essays left and right. Catapult, The Rumpus, More With Medium, Broke Into Lit Hub. And um, it was great. Now I had one bad experience that I'm not gonna get into right now because for the sake of time, but I will say I got a little too hot to trot and I had sent an essay too early one time and the editor had given me feedback that I really didn't like, but I took it because I wasn't prepared and I'd sent the essay too early. And that today is one of my least favorite essays. And while I was like in the moment with this editor being like, thank you for your notes, I realized I didn't really like that experience at all like how they were interacting with me. It's important to know it's, it's about self-dignity, right? So many people that think that we need to strip ourselves of our self-dignity when we come to these spaces, which isn't true. So I was pitching um, a lot of different essays. I said I was gonna be short with this, my apologies. It's pitching a lot of different <laughs> essays and I had become close with some editors, an editor at Lit Hub, amazing woman, um, and an editor at uh, Medium. And the editor from Medium asked me to meet up with him. I said, oh, this is cool. You know, I don't know anything about editors of anything. You know, I'd written some pieces and placed them, but we met up. And then he said, listen, man, I spoke to my agent about your work, but he's really old school. And I don't think he's just going to get to it. But I have a friend that I could, you know, introduce your work to as well. I said, yeah, okay, cool. So he made good on what he said. Now there, were, there ended up being a transaction going down with, <laughs> with him being like, yeah, man, I introduced you to this agent. Uh, I need you to come speak at a school that I do some work with. Me, I'm always here for the, for the, for the students. So it, it's fine. Um, and I enjoyed it, but he introduced me to his friend. I spoke to his friend on the phone, like the next day or a couple of days later. And she said, I don't represent fiction, but I do nonfiction and you know, do you have any ideas? And we hashed out an idea right there on the phone that we were both excited about. She hadn't even really read my essays before. So when she had read my essays that night, she's like, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And I said, okay, are you going to represent me? And she says, hold on, hold on. Like, you know, um, I need to get an overview of what this work will be. So I said, say less. I wrote this overview in a couple hours, sent it to her. And then she gave me an offer representation that evening. It was basically all like the same day or one day later. Now, remember, I was working on Black Buck at this point, and I can't tell you the exact, this might've been January, 2019. I was working on Black Buck. It was my novel that was my main thing. But if we were gonna break in with nonfiction, I would have done that too. So at that point, I had queried other agents. So when I got this offer and she's like, okay, are you gonna say yes? I said, hold up. I knew, it, I, knew much, I knew as much at this point to say, I need 10 to 14 days. Then I had up all those other agents who were either reading my work or who I had queried but hadn't gotten back to me. And I sent that nice, fat subject line, offer of representation. And I let them know that I had, a, I had an offer. Ooh, it felt so good. Let them know that I had an offer on the table. And then I had a few come back to me saying, hold up, I'm reading right now. I'm going to accelerate my reading. And then within a couple of days or a week's time, I now had three, off three offers. Um, and two were from my novel and one was from the original agent for my nonfiction book. And um, the agent that I went with, we vibed immediately on the phone. Um, she was an editor for 20 years, which was important to me because she understood that side of the business. And she was an agent at that point for about a year. Um, she had acquired Colson Whitehead's first two books when she was an editor. She's not black, but I said, okay, she's worked with the black people before, <laughs> you know, like, like, and, and I respect Colson Whitehead and she helped bring him into this literary world. So there's that. Um, three is 
we had some conversations where I felt like when, if and when she would try to sell my work, she was going to try to get a nice bag for it. Again, she hadn't promised me anything, but that's just the vibe that I got. I got the vibe that like she wasn't eating ramen, <laughs> you know, um, not to say that she was eating caviar, but I didn't get the vibe that she was eating ramen. So all of that combined, um, I took a little bit more time and then I, I gave the other two agents some nice rejection letters. And then I accepted with this woman and uh, yeah. And, and then we went from there. Gotcha. So I, I want to, I want to jump to when black Buck sold and now where you are now, you know, again, it's one of those things where it's like as authors before this stuff happens, we try to envision what it would be like. How, how do you feel like you have changed either as a writer or as a person since your book hit the shelves? Do you feel more validated now? I mean, I'm sure you do, but how, how has your writing, do you feel changed since you've published black Buck? So let me ask Josh, how, how has my writing changed or how have I changed or both? Let's do both. <laughs> okay. <laughs> how has my writing changed? Or it might not have. Hmm. How has my writing changed? Well, I'd like to think that I'm a better writer. And the way that I define better is am I able to turn my ideas into reality on the page? There are ideas that I have that I don't feel good enough to tackle on the page yet in time, right? But there are things that I'm trying right now that I wouldn't have tried in 2018 when I was writing Black Buck, either because the idea would have never crossed my mind or I wouldn't even know where to begin. So, I feel as though I've grown as a writer in terms of skill because I am slightly more comfortable taking bigger risks. For me, that is how I judge myself as a writer and as a person in general with the amount of risk that I feel comfortable taking. I never want to take the easy way out or not more often than not. Um, with my second book, for example, people are probably expecting something in the vein of Black Buck. I have at least two other solid ideas that, that smeck of Black Buck, but I'm not doing those right now because I want to continue to grow as a writer, which means taking more risks. Um, so my writing, I believe, has become slightly more fine-tuned. There's always going to be room for growth the more that I write and the more that I realize I don't know. Um, in some ways it's become more ambitious, um, and that's exciting. So yeah, there's that, how I've changed. I'm never going to forget writing black buck in my childhood bedroom at my parents' house, you know, having to move back home. I'm never going to forget that. So I believe I'll always remain grounded in that way, but I've definitely changed in that I care far less <laughs> about what other people think um, than when I first started out. When I first started out and I was writing that first book and I'd go on Twitter, I saw these people who I thought were the bee's knees because of a variety of different reasons, whether they spoke loudly or they had a lot of followers or something. And as I moved to the industry, I realized that um, a lot of those people weren't my people. You know, I was just looking at them on a superficial level. And then there were people who I didn't know were my people, who actually were my people in my community. Um, so that's how I've changed. I've continued to embrace community. Um, I've also changed in that I focus more on the reader than anyone else. You know, I look at someone like Kiese Lehman, right? Author of Heavy, author of uh, a, whole, a whole bunch of incredible books. And I view Kiese as the Muhammad Ali of the literary industry. And I would like to be that as well. I want to be the people's writer. I want to have a lot of readers messing with me. Having writers I can rely on and call friends is cool, but I am more so interested in 
being able to get down in the nitty gritty with readers. And I love doing that on Instagram. I primarily do it on Instagram, sometimes on Twitter, but more so on Instagram. I used to do these uh, Instagram lives. I did them for eight weeks straight when the book was coming out and I do them every once in a while. And being able to engage with readers in meaningful ways and bring them up on live and talk to them and hear from them, even if they weren't feeling the book, right? It's not a prereq that you have to like my book and praise me to, to get up there. You know what I'm saying? Like it's all fair game. So, so that for me has been one of the, um, highlights of this whole journey, in addition to having more influence and impact on uh, that, that I can impart on people trying to break in. You know, um, I have people who have taught me things and who continue to teach me things, but I did struggle when I was getting into the industry because I didn't have anyone to walk me through, right? Like I told you, <laughs> I, was, I was querying the top literary agents in America with an unedited manuscript. So now today, again, one of my greatest joys is being able to pay it forward. And when I can give someone advice and then they hit me up and say, yo, I got a book deal or yo, I placed this essay or yo, I just made a hundred dollars from this, from this piece. Um, there's almost no joy greater than that, you know, knowing that I continue, that I can continue to have an impact in that way and help other people grow. And you mentioned, you know, being in a place where you didn't have anyone either. Where did you start finding that? Where did you start building your community from? Especially, you know, writing is, is supposed to be such a solitary thing. I mean, it's not something you do with other people usually. So where did you start looking to find people around you? Yeah, um, it's hard. I was always emailing people you know, coming from the world of sales, I don't even know how I was really picking who I emailed. Maybe someone that had recently published a book or someone whose book I read or heard about. Um, in 2016, when I was querying my first manuscript, I had found Viet Tinh Nguyen's email, right? Author of The Sympathizer. And I found his email and I emailed him <laughs> and he responded. I was like, hey, man, you know, can I can we Skype or like spend some time via Zoom? Or I don't even not Zoom back then. I don't know. Yeah, Zoom was around, but I don't think mm -hmm. people were using it as frequently. Um, and I hit him up and I was like, you know, do you have time? And then he hit me back and he said, Mateo, I don't even have time for my own family. He said, the, the road to being published is a long one. It still is even for me, but I wish you luck. And that felt so validating to me. That felt great. But for the most part, people that I would reach out to wouldn't get back to me or, you know, this, that, and the other. And by no means was, am I entitled. No one owes me their time. But it was helping me realize that I'm starting from scratch in this industry. So it wasn't until July 2018 I told you around the time that I met Jason Reynolds, I'd gotten into uh, a writer's colony that you referenced in my bio, the Rhode Island Writers Colony. And the Rhode Island Writers Colony is a writing colony, a residency of sort that takes place for two weeks in a war in Rhode Island. And it is for people of color. And I got in and I went there for two weeks and I was meeting all these amazing writers. I did uh, a public reading in Providence. And that was the first and one of the strongest writing communities that I belong to, because it is, as you said, a solitary pursuit. And I'm not one of these people who are in writing groups. For me, I'm not someone who writes around other people. It's just not what I do, even though I understand the value in it. I'm not someone who's constantly send, I never send friends my work really. You know, I have an agent, I have an editor that I work with, and um, I don't want too many cooks in the kitchen. To each their own though, right? Um, but the Rhode Island Writers Colony for me was this beautiful, loving family where I felt accepted, I felt lifted up, I felt validated in ways that I didn't know I need. I felt supported in ways that I wasn't aware of. So that was um, one of the first times I felt it. And then when the book came out and I started interacting with bookstagram, especially black bookstagrammers who today, I count some of them as my friends, real friends, you know, not just like book friends, but real friends. So that, that uh, I would say has been maybe the second community or third. It, it's hard to say about community with other writers beyond the Rhode Island Writers Colony. I am in community with many writers, but I don't belong to like any groups. But yeah, Bookstagram has been incredible. So those are uh, a few of the communities that I'm a part of and that continue to lift me up. And then I, you know, being where you are now, is there anything that you know now that you wish you'd known earlier? Or are you like a believer that everything had to happen the way it happened for a reason? Or is there anything that you could wish you could tell your younger self whenever you started writing, started querying, anything like that? 
I wouldn't have told them anything. I wouldn't have told them anything um, because the way that things worked out, I am grateful. I feel privileged to be in this position. And it's like the butterfly effect, you know, like there is a world where I give my younger self some advice when I'm writing that first manuscript and that first manuscript gets me an agent and sold those first two manuscripts I wrote. I am so happy that they didn't come out. I'm so happy that they didn't come out. I think that they would have ruined my career in a way. And I'm not talking about people reading them and not liking them. People could have liked them, but it would have made it come too fast and too easily. Um, It would have had me on a path of writing in a way that I didn't really want to be. Um, It would have made me, I think, far more submissive to other people in the industry. And it would have put me in a weaker position, I believe, than the one that I am now. So I wouldn't have told the younger me anything. But if I could tell people that are writing now, you know, and who want to break in a few things, one is um, really hone your vision for your work. Understand why you're writing it. Like why, why are you writing this? You, you need to know your why and your purpose, or otherwise things could just go out of whack. Um, have an idea of who your audience is, even if it's just yourself, even if it's just your mom. And I'm saying to meditate on these things every day. Um, understand that anyone who you see on social media, myself included, they're not the bee's knees. They are no better or worse than you. Doesn't matter if they've sold a million books. Doesn't matter if, you know, they've been a New York Times bestseller. They are not worth more than you. Um, and maybe the third thing I would say is, and I know this is a little hallmarky, but try and remember to have fun and stay loose. For me, I feel as though I write my best and I feel most unencumbered when I'm loose and having fun on the page and not when I'm just, you know, jaw clenched and I got to get this out, you know? So, yeah. Right. Yeah. And then I want to rewind even further now back to when you first started writing. I'm always so curious what inspired people to start in the first place. So what was it that you were trying to accomplish when you started writing for the first time? Um, I needed an outlet. Mm-hmm. So I was working. This is maybe the fourth time that I'm saying this now. I don't mean to sound like a broken record, <laughs> but I was working in sales at a startup and I wasn't like, a peon. <laughs> you know, I was a boss. I was a young boss. I was 24 managing 30 people. I had a lot of power, um, made a handful of poor decisions and I needed an outlet. I was waking up, man. I was getting out of the sunken place and I needed, um, to become healthier in my lifestyle and my modes of thinking and in my emotional sphere. So I began to write because I remembered as as a younger person, how much I loved writing. And I began writing essays and articles. This was beginning of 2016. And that felt good. Even though people I worked with, my boss thought it was at odds with what I was doing in this workplace, which is probably a good thing. And then it was May 21st, 2016, when I said, you know what? Let me just write a novel. I've always liked fiction. Let me just, let me just try it you know, no real plan. I said, let me just, let me just try this, you know, uh, to build on this outlet of writing that I was using. And it was when I began writing fiction that I realized that for me, fiction and writing it was a very specific form of salvation. I felt bliss. It was the type of thing where I was doing it and I didn't know how many hours would pass by. It felt so good. And I finished that first draft in like four, four and a half months, quit my job, had some savings, went to travel, went to go make it as a writer. Um, first, first manuscript didn't work, right? Second didn't work, but third did. But so that's where, that's where the impetus came from. I needed an outlet. I needed an escape from the life that I was living. Um, and then as I began to take it more seriously, did I realize that this was something that I actually wanted to do? You know, not to go on a tangent, but when Colson Whitehead, I think around 2019, when he came out with the Nickel Boys, um, I didn't know him. He didn't know me. I'd like to think that he knows who I am now because he wrote a blurb for Black Buck, you know. Um, But we've never really met or spoken that much. But he was giving an event. This was like the launch event at Barnes & Noble's Union Square. And 
you know, he was describing his own journey and um, his first book. I believe like he lost his agent because of it. Like they just really didn't think it was good at all. And a few other moments of failure took place. And I said, I asked a question. I don't know why. Whenever I ask a question in an audience, my heart starts really like beating. Like I get Same. nerves going. It's weird. <laughs> it's weird. Like whenever I'm about to ask a question, um, heart pumping. And I, and I, I said, I don't know what I called him, Colson, Mr. Whitehead, or if I didn't address him as anything. And I said, why didn't you give up? Just asked him very plainly. And Colson has a stock answer that he, that he has um, about how he wasn't going to be a veterinarian, a lawyer, this, that, the other. Writing is the only thing that he could do. But something he said resonated with me deeply that I'll never forget. He said, when you commit, you become the artist that you're supposed to be or that you're meant to be. So um, yeah, when I committed to writing, the same happened for me. I became the person that I might have not known back then I wanted to be, but definitely the person that I want to be today and, and someone who's constantly growing and changing. So then because I have to ask, you know, we as writers, we all are going to face rejection. Were there any times where you felt like giving up or was this always something you were going to push through no matter what? In November 2017, when we started out in this conversation, mm -hmm. um, I had serious doubts for the first time in that journey because I was coming out of this world of, sale, uh, of sales as someone with a lot of influence, someone who people in this New York City sales startup community knew and respected. Um, or, you know, had, had thoughts about, let's say. Um, I came into this world of writing with a lot of undue bravado, thinking that I was going to make it. And throughout my journey, and with those two books not going anywhere, there was a necessary humbling. And it was during that time after the second book when it didn't go anywhere that I was like, what am I doing? Who did I think I was? There were serious doubt. I don't know if I can say that I was ready to quit, but I had some serious doubt that I had to move past. Um, maybe there were other flashing moments where I thought about quitting, um, but none of them really stand out to me right now. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if I did have some of those. I want to get to some audience questions now, just so I can make sure we get them covered. So if there are more questions out there, by all means, post them here. Uh, First question, basic question, where did you send your essays when you mentioned you were, you were pitching them places? What kind of places were you sending them? Yeah, give me, give me one second, everyone. It's getting real dark in here. <laughs> Let there be light. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, so where was I sending these essays? Mm -hmm. I was sending them to a variety of places, but the places that I placed essays with, and people can look these up now, were... Um, Literary Hub, love Literary Hub. I will never have anything bad to say about Literary Hub. I am a consumer of Literary Hub. It's how I get a lot of my literary news and, and you know, learn about other authors and books. Um, can't say enough good things about Lit Hub. Catapult, I placed an essay with Catapult. Um, the Rumpus, placed an essay with The Rumpus. Medium. Um, got a love, got a lot of love for the people that were running Medium back then. Um, I think that there have been some staff changes, um, have semi-complicated feelings about Medium's readership <laughs> because these people got a lot of opinions, let's say that. Um, and, and they, some of them take it too far, but was grateful for that. Medium also pays very well. You know, I would have, I would have still written those pieces for free, right? Someone like the Rumpus. I wrote that and I didn't get paid for it. A piece that I wrote an entrepreneur, I didn't get paid for it. So it's not like it's, it's just about the money. Um, it was important that people discuss money in the business of this because too many people are in the dark or feel like, oh, we shouldn't be talking about this and these figures. Why? That helps other people not get got, you know? Um, so yeah, those places, am I forgetting anywhere? Electric Literature, publish an essay there. Not in 2019 though, that came later, maybe 2020. Um, so those were a few places. Um, recently I've written for Mr. Porter, the men's magazine, um, other places that I really mess with. Yeah. 
I might be forgetting. I wrote for the New York Times and it was <laughs> it was it was a cool experience. I really liked the editor, but they were censoring me a lot, which I was surprised by, but I probably shouldn't have been. They made me cut out some vulgarity <laughs> in the piece that I was writing. And I was like, come on, New York Times. Um, so yeah, those are those are some places that uh, I've written in some places that I would recommend. Next question. You mentioned being in a sunken, sunken place when you started writing. What do you mean by sunken place? Sunken place, as I saw someone in the chat mention, uh, Amy, it's from the movie Get Out. And a lot of people today refer to the sunken place primarily as a place where you lose yourself or more specifically speaking to black people when black people lose their sense of self or feel as though they've transcended blackness in a way where they are exempt from racism or where they are post-racial. So I felt as though when I was working at that startup, in hindsight, I realized that I was in the sunken place a little bit, you know, um, and I had to work to get out of there. And a lot of people helped me. And I'm just so grateful for having left that place because it's a place where you think a lot of people are your friends when they're not. You think that you're something potentially that you're not. And maybe some people can live that life and, and, and die and feeling happy. But um, at some point or another, I feel as though with many people, you're going to start having thoughts and questions keep you up at night that you're not going to be able to ignore. Next question. Uh, I wonder how I would create a community for my writing when I want to write under a pen name. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, never, never do a Zoom. Um, never, right? Never share your your real information with them. That that's tr that's that's tough to be honest. I've never done anything like this. What I would recommend is maybe curating your community one by one and keeping it small, but with a group of people whom you truly trust. Right? It's also not like you have to, you know, tell everyone your social security number and everything from the jump. Um, you are in charge. Um, so yeah, uh, there, there's one way to do that. Um, you could also start a bookstagram or a book Twitter where you never have to share your real information and then start writing under there and, and use it to segue, you know, from your bookstagram or your book Twitter. And then, you know, um, you use that same name for your books. You know, it's just, I don't know what it means to not share your photo then, but I would take it one step at a time, you know, just start, start finding people that you trust and then go from there. And when we all know that Stacey Abrams, right, we, we know she's writing some erotica, you know, if it's not a problem for Stacey, I'm not supposed, I'm not going to say that's not supposed to be a problem for you, but um, I think it'll be all right. But take it one step at a time. That's really what I'm saying, right? Now. Take it one step at a time, one person at a time, feel, feel them out see who you trust and go from there, but understand that you never need to share more information with anyone than you feel is necessary. Next question. I was wondering why you discarded your first and second manuscripts. Well, they just weren't good, really. <laughs> and they were focused on a subject and topic that I'm not proud of, related to one of my experiences. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Next question. I'm a queer person of color, and I wonder how you suggest already marginalized identities navigate this current writing publishing world. Hey, Lucky. Um, yeah, that's critical. I would say understand that our stories, and I say our as marginalized or people who are sometimes marginalized, um, are more valuable than ever. People are realizing, and I say valuable in terms of needing to get out there, right? So that other people who uh, identify as us can feel less alone and feel more empowered. But I also mean valuable financially, right? We're, we're now seeing in the age of Black Panther that non-white stories can be financially lucrative to folks. So, that ties into the fact that we shouldn't devalue ourselves financially, that we shouldn't be afraid to ask for what we believe we deserve. Now, there are limits. There are people who come into industries who say, I want a million dollars. 
when maybe you're not, maybe you, <laughs> what you're putting out isn't worth a million dollars, but that's not to say it's not worth 50 or a hundred. You have to do your due diligence and be the judge of that. When I was, when we were going on submission with Black Buck, my novel, I had a rubric basically for different amounts that I would feel happy about, elated about, not happy about, whatever this, that, and the other. And, and that for me was a good, um, was a good measuring stick. So yeah, those would be a few things. Our stories are extremely valuable. Please do not wait to get them out into the world. Please do not allow any fears or doubts or lack of representation to a certain extent hold you back from taking the jump and writing or creating whatever it is that you want. And lastly, I would say, um, make sure you have a strong vision for your work and you articulate that vision for yourself and that you articulate that vision to other people. It goes back to what I was saying about having a why and knowing your audience. Because if you have that vision, and if you are sure and confident in that vision, it is going to be harder for anyone else, especially people who do not look like you or identify as you, to push you to do something else because they will try. Hopefully that helps, Lucky. Wow, these uh, questions are pouring in at the end. And they always do, right at the end. Uh, so let's, let's do this one. How do you organize your writing life slash projects you're working on? Or do you work on one project at a time? Basically your whole organization principle. Um, okay. How do I organize this from Aaron? Thanks Aaron. Mm -hmm. Life projects you're working on, or do you work on one project at a time? Hmm, this is a good question. I'm not the type of person who will work on multiple books at a time. Um, but I'm also not someone who discriminates my, uh, against my ideas. <laughs> if, I have, if I have any idea, I pop it into my notes app. I use Evernote and I'll jot down more ideas below that. And as time goes on, I may never touch that idea again, or I might jot down more ideas uh, beneath it or for that note. And if an idea sticks with me, then I know that it has some validity or at least is worthy enough for me pursuing in some form. Um, and how enthusiastic about, about that project that I am will then determine whether I have the stamina, right? For a novel, if I'm thinking about an idea for months, then I say, okay, this is probably something that I, that I can pursue as a novel because then I'm going to have to spend years either working on it or at least talking about it. I wrote Black Buck fairly quickly. I wrote the first draft in five months in 2018, right? And then edited it, edited it a few times, got that agent in 2019, sold the book in August 2019. Book came out in January 2021. A year later, here we are talking about writing, but also related to my book. You see, this is, uh, it's, it's been, you know, four years at this point, essentially, that I've been, you know, talking about Black Buck. Um, now, that's not to say that I, I, I might not take detours. So, for example, I am working on my second novel, but since my book has come out, I have been, um, I have been presented many opportunities, a variety of opportunities, things I know that aren't typical. I mean, I was in a commercial for Grubhub. <laughs> I did a Grubhub commercial. That's random, right? Like I did a Grubhub <laughs> commercial. That took time. And that took time away from my writing. I wrote a short story for this sort of secret project that will be revealed in April. I wrote another short story for a project that will be revealed next month. I wrote an essay for Mr. Porter that came out last week. I um, gave a speech in DC to 275 people. I've done corporate engagements. So there's a variety of different things and projects that are happening, Aaron. I've shot commercials for Black Buck. I'm gonna shoot a commercial in French for the French version that comes out next month called Buck et Moi, but like commercials that I'm making on my own, not like a Grubhub, you know? So with all of these projects, I try to make sure that I can hone in on them and be focused. And what that means is really focusing on one project a day, sometimes other things, but focusing on one project a day. I take it on a day by day basis. So today or four days out of this week might be focused on my second book. One day might be dedicated to writing an essay and then maybe another day dedicated to revising it, another day dedicated to um, shooting a commercial. So I'm taking it day by day, but also constantly prioritizing for me, and, and those priorities shift depending on how much time I have to complete something. Hopefully that helps a little bit, Aaron. So again, prioritizing, 
based on deadlines and enthusiasm and capacity. So that means that I have to constantly plan and constantly be shifting and remain flexible to what's going on around me. I'm going to slip, slip one more question in here, and it's the one from India. How has your time in the startup industry served you in the literary world? Has it hindered you in any way as a writer or otherwise? Hey, India. Um, no, it hasn't hindered me in any way, fortunately, unless there are forces at work that I'm not aware of. <laughs> Who knows? Some of those people that gave me one-star reviews <laughs> on Goodreads, <laughs> they could be people that I worked with. I don't know. It's a conspiracy. Um, but no, my time in the startup industry has only served me. It gave me a strong business foundation. Um, it made me no stranger to discussing large sums of money. Um, and again, my background in sales is, is, is tied. It's intertwined with uh, my, my career in, in the world of startups. It has helped given me um, a solid skill set when interacting with a variety of different people and listening and, and tailoring my approach to them while also uh, knowing to remain as authentic and genuine as possible. It has helped me build upon what I know to be my strengths. Um, it has helped push me to remain disciplined in my work ethic and flexible at the same time and have a large amount of stamina. It has helped me um, be as aware as possible about who has my, my, my best interests at heart and who are really reaching out to me for themselves or something that's self-interested. Um, yeah, it's helped me in far in far more ways than, than in any way that I could think that it's hindered me. I can't really think of a way that it's hindered me. I've definitely made mistakes throughout my journey, but when you're working in the world of startups and sales, the maxims are fail fast, move fast and break things, break, break things, you know, or continue to iterate. So I've, I've held on to that throughout my journey. So lastly, I just want to give you a chance to tell people you mentioned it already, but where can people find you online, your website, your, your social media. And then if you have anything to promote, this is your time to throw it out there. Yeah. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Twitter at, Ask Mateo, A-S-K-M-A-T-E-O. I am more active on Instagram, even though I've been taking a break for a few days. Um, you can also email me, Mateo at MateoWrites.com. Um, and, and the thing that I want to promote is don't wait for tomorrow, do it today. Love it. Awesome. Mateo, this was fantastic. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate you taking the time and yeah, just thank you. It was great. Josh, always a pleasure. Hope we could do this again. Everyone, thank you for your attention, your questions. Much love. Have a great rest of your week and be well. Awesome. So to all of our listeners, uh, we are doing this. Again, this recording will be available in the next couple of days. We're, gonna, we're off next week. We will be back the following week. Uh, we're talking to Teddy Leo, who's an assistant editor at Aftershock Comics. Uh, so we'll see you then. Again, this is our normal time now. So 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, yeah, you all know where to reach me, josh at gothamwriters.com if you have any questions or anything. And we'll hope to see you in a couple of weeks.